um, I would like to welcome everyone for joining our webinar on telemedicine today. Um, during this webinar, we'll hear from two speakers from two organizations, Zipnosis, a virtual, virtual care company, and Fredrickson and Byron, a law firm. Um, the telemedicine visionary Jonathan Pierce, the CEO of Zipnosis, and digital health attorney Ryan Johnson, who's an attorney at Fredrickson and Byron, will join the Medi Medical Industry Leadership Institute, MILI, to discuss the current state and future of this rapidly evolving telemedicine and digital health industry. Quick introductions. My name is Punar Karajamandic. I am the C. Arthur Williams Jr. Professor of Healthcare Risk Management in the Department of Finance at the Carlson School of Management of University of Minnesota. I'm also the Academic Director of the Medical Industry Leadership Institute, MILI. Um, today, I look forward to our conversation with John and Ryan on various topics, including emerging telehealth business models, key legal and regulatory issues in this space, technological innovation in telehealth, the future of telehealth industry, and as well as some real life examples. I'm looking forward to hear from uh, both of them on successful um, telehealth strategies. So let me briefly introduce our guests and then I will also let them give you more details on their background very shortly. So let's starting with John Pierce. John is the CEO of Zipnosis. He co-founded Zipnosis in 2009 under the idea that there had to be a better and more consumer-centric way to deliver healthcare. Since 2009, Zipnosis has continued to be a catalyst in driving the healthcare industry forward working with healthcare leaders across the country to integrate technology into care delivery. Prior to founding Zipnosis, John got his undergrad in Russian language and computer science from the St. Olaf College. Then in 2000, he began working at healthcare startup, uh, Provation Medical, until it was acquired by Walters Kluwer in 2006 for over $100 million. It was during this time uh, studying for an MBA at the Carlson School of Management that John's vision for Zipnosis really took hold and the rest, the rest is basically company history as he shares with us. Uh, fun fact about John, rain or shine, and of course snow because he is a Minnesota resident after all, you can find John running, tickling the ivories and laughing until it hurts with his son and wife. Thank you, John, for joining us. Welcome, thank you. Next, we have Ryan Johnson, who is a nationally recognized lawyer for healthcare innovation with Fredrickson and Byron. Ryan has considerable experience in structuring and negotiating healthcare transactions, including mergers and acquisitions, joint ventures, licensing agreements and financing, and advising clients on a variety of regulatory matters. His clients uh, include leading digital health and healthcare IT companies, as well as independent physician practices and other healthcare providers, national pharmacies and retail clinics, physician and dental management companies, medical device companies, international healthcare franchisers, private equity and venture capital groups, and many, many other innovative healthcare entrepreneurs and in inventors. Um, Ryan helps his clients develop and launch innovative business models designed to improve healthcare quality, accessibility, and affordability. Um, he serves as um, outside general counsel for digital health companies and healthcare providers who are transforming healthcare through their innovation and cutting edge science and technology. Um, Ryan has a BA in political science and philosophy from Gustavus Adolphus College and a JD from University of Minnesota's law school. So with that, we are ready to start our webinar. Um, just before, a quick note to the audience. We really want this webinar to be as interactive as possible. I know given the Zoom conditions and the virtual uh, situations, it's, it may be difficult to do, but we are really looking forward to your active questions to both of our guests. And um, if you ask, as, as you have questions, um, please use the chat box. I will do my very best to monitor the chat box and incorporate your questions into my questions to our guests. So with that, let's start our webinar. Um, I want to start with, yes, I gave some introduction to both of our speakers, but I want them to tell us a little bit about their background and their role in their organization. We can start with John and then move on to Ryan. 
Thanks. So I'll, I'll start with um, something that we stress pretty hard here at Zygnosis, which is uh, my superpower. And I think everybody has it. And it's, it's kind of a nice way to frame up what you do really well on a day-to-day -day basis. And, and my superpower is to have a vision, to articulate it, and to inspire others to achieve it. And that's what I do every single day in big ways. Sometimes it's hypnosis as we think about how we start to power this virtual first ecosystem. And in little ways, as we look at you know maneuvering on a day-to-day -day basis and, and sort of mentoring and helping move the, the company and the team forward. So that's a little bit about who I am and that's what I bring in. It means that I can often sort of see what comes a couple steps down the road. It also means that I also don't see the next step in front of me. And that means that I have to build a good team around that is able to translate that vision and operations into solid financials and, and mechanics on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so that's a little bit about what do I do. What do I really do functionally on a daily basis? It, it's, it's really a lot of context switching. And, and certainly now in this environment in, in telemedicine, uh, since March, it has been a, a really hot burn. Um, and I have had conversations with almost every investor in the United States. Um, I've talked um, all the way up from the White House to local governments and, and, and policymakers about telemedicine, how it works, what are the benefits, um, run the care continuum on, on uh, partners that Ryan um, knows very well on retail clinics and traditional healthcare delivery models. Um, and a lot of my time is spent really interacting with those constituents um, on a day-to-day on -day basis and really looking at how Zipnosis fits within that ecosystem and also how we can have an influence on it uh, because healthcare is transforming. Um, it has been much more reliant on digital type tools like Zipnosis. Um, and it gives a really great opportunity to bring the, the conversation to bear on it. Uh, for those of you that are watching at home, this is our uh, values wall um, here, a little bit about Zygnosis and the culture that we, we have. So the acronym is BRAVE and it's bold, resilient, accountable, vulnerable, and enthusiastic. I'll get out of the way. I like to say that first one's actually bald if you look at it, um, which of course it makes sense. There's no mandate to shave your head, but it certainly helps. I support it. <laughs> it's very important. Um, that's a little bit about the culture we have here and, and we fostered. And, and I think in general, and it's a, a great honor and pleasure to, to serve every day with a, a fantastic group of people that live uh, to these standards and, and certainly have been on the front lines uh, with the healthcare workers um, um, for the past well, six months now and, and heading into a very critical time here for us. Absolutely. Thank you, John. Thank you. Ryan? Sure. So I'm a corporate healthcare attorney uh, at Frederickson and Byron. Uh, I've been practicing at Frederickson for almost 20 years, and I'm able to run with John's idea of a superpower. So I think the the superpower, um, um, you know, that I have is you know helping clients hopefully understand not just the laws but what's around the corner, right? So that helps uh, clients hopefully be uh, may make informed decisions, uh, strategize, and hopefully achieve their business objectives. Um, the nice thing about Frederickson is I work with a large team. Right, so a lot of us work in the healthcare space, uh, in the medical device industry, and so we have lots of subject matter experts who I rely upon heavily, depending on what the project is for for the client. Um, it's been a, it's been a great run at Frederickson, and it will go on for a long time. We're doing a ton of work in the digital health space. That's just exploded with um, it was exploded before COVID, and you know with COVID, really telemedicine, digital health are just really really taking off. Yeah, no, thank you, and I'm going to put a note for Kim and I, next time we do a webinar, our first question will be, what's your superpower? <laughs> That's how we're gonna start. <laughs> so, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I like that. Um, so um, so the one question I have, I mean, John, we could start with you um, and you know, Ryan, you can also, um, you can chime in and also, but um, you know, some of our audience is clearly familiar with telehealth, telemedicine, um, but also um, even those of us who are very well into it, this is still a very growing, emerging, uh, evolving area, uh, a field uh, that we, we wanna keep up with, right? So from your perspective, John, from the Zipnosis perspective, um, how do you even define the market for telehealth? Like, you know, at Carlson we have our classes, we do market sizing and, you know, like some of the, the, the standard techniques that we do, right? Um, you know, what are some of the key stakeholders? How do we, how can we even conceptualize the total addressable market in telemedicine and, and what's your company's role in it? 
Yeah, it's it's probably I, I think honestly one of the most important questions for for telemedicine and virtual care. And um, I'll set it up and say the way that that telemedicine has been uh, defined from a total addressable market has really been about how many video visits can you do at a certain price, whether or not it's retail or paid through an insurance reimbursed. And that's the number of visits time the price and you generally get to a total addressable market, right? And that's been the, the traditional way of doing it. There have been some sub segments of it, but generally that's the, the standard way of defining telemedicine. And telemedicine um, I think is, is a pretty um, arcane term and it really references you know, the phone call, being able to do a, a conversation or diagnosis over the phone, or again, more traditionally over a, a video-based type of connection. And um, that's been the, the traditional. What we're seeing now though, is that virtual care, and I think this is the term that's gonna be much more prevalent than telemedicine going forward. And um, you know, some of this is, is wonky um, nomenclature, but it does matter because virtual care really starts to embrace this notion that we're moving away from these discrete events that happen real time between a patient and a doctor into a stream of interactions that are enabled through technology. And what that means is that you have to look at the total addressable market, not as how many telemedicine video visits can you do at X price, but really how does that fit within a capitated model? How does that fit within chronic disease management, et cetera? I think to get to drill down a little bit. So that's the big sort of shift that's happening within telemedicine as you think about the, the defining the total addressable market. McKinsey did a pretty good job um, um, this summer, I think of, of quantifying it. And they looked at it and I think it said it's about 250 billion roughly. I think that starts to capture um, roughly what the total addressable market is. Although I think it's even higher than that when you look at the percentage of encounters, healthcare encounters that can be replaced by digital tools. I think conservatively, you're probably in that 30% mark right now and it's gonna to continue to expand. And so really the way I look at telemedicine isn't how many visits at X price, it's what percentage of healthcare spend is being converted into that digital ecosystem. And I think to assume that a third of that, whether or not it's transaction or revenue or at-risk agreements, can be managed in a digital world, I think that's a very reasonable assumption. So take a trillion dollars, a trillion plus, you're looking at 300 billion you know, plus probably on a total addressable market in a, in a defensible way. And I think we're just kind of getting started with, uh, with that. Yeah, and it's gonna, that definition will keep evolving as, as, as I guess. So um, Ryan, from your perspective, as you work with the clients in this space, um, before COVID, what were some of the, 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 the key segments that you were mainly working with? And um, what were some of the driving forces as you saw in sort of the pre-COVID world? And, and how is it changing now in terms of um, the stakeholders and the segments in the market? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, I think it's useful to divide sort of the regulatory world into sort of before COVID during COVID where we are now and, and, you know, what we expect post-COVID. So, uh, you know, pre-COVID, you know, lots of the rules and regulations we had in the books, they were really designed, um, you know, for old technology, for old concerns. The law often plays catch-up. Uh, policymakers often have a hard time predicting the future. So these emerging technologies, emerging business models, often bump up against rules that don't make a lot of sense, right? Maybe they made sense 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. <laughs> but they don't make sense today, right? Given, again, current technology and, you know, current policy issues and business models. So, you know, pre-COVID, you know, the big issues, uh, you know, were licensure, right? Who's going to treat the patient? Um, where is the patient located? And what type of license is required uh, for the provider to, to treat that patient using a telemedicine platform? And that's the key issue really in any uh, telemedicine arrangement. Um, and because we're, you know, we have a number of states um, and each state really is in control of licensure. There was a challenge for national telemedicine companies to figure out what the licensure requirements were in each state. If there were material variations, how do they you know, create a business model that they can roll out across the US, right? There's a lot of expense there, a lot of cost, a lot of hassle, uh, and these laws change, right? So there's uncertainty. Uh, but licensure was a big issue. And you're always looking at the laws of the state, both where the patient is located and where the provider is located. 
And we'll talk a bit about how some of these rules changed over loosens during COVID, probably a little bit, and get deeper into that. Um, you know, some states had a better set of sort of clear rules and regulations on what was allowed. And others, again, because the rules were drafted um, in earlier times, the rules were somewhat ambiguous, right? And created, again, challenges for telemedicine companies. You know, what was allowed under what circumstances? Um, how comfortable are you operating in the gray zone where you don't have black and white rules? And, you know, some companies take on more risk and, you know, others, others don't, right? Um, in addition to uh, licensure, reimbursement. I mean, the reimbursement is one of the, the biggest issues, right? And so pre-COVID, again, you have a patchwork of Medicaid reimbursement rules. You know, every state can have a different set of reimbursement, um, you know, regimes under Medicaid. Commercial payers had different approaches for reimbursing, you know, telemedicine encounters. And Medicare was, you know, very very serious limitations on uh, how telemedicine could be reimbursed, right? And again, many of these rules and regulations were loosened uh, during COVID and hopefully post-COVID, we'll see some, again, increased reimbursement continue. Uh, but just to give you a sense of some of the limitations, you know, pre-COVID, um, you know, Medicare uh, really limited where telemedicine could be provided. Uh, you had to be an, el an eligible originating site which required the patient to be in a medical facility um, and patients couldn't get telemedicine from their homes. You know, and that changed during COVID. That's a game changer, right? If patients can log on from their home, from their apartment, wherever they might be and see a telemedicine practitioner, that's much more convenient for the patient and providers are going to, to run with that if they're going to get paid, right? I mean, reimbursement is, is huge. Um, so hopefully some of these loosenings to reimbursement, to licensure, um, those will continue post COVID. And we can get into those exceptions and waivers if you want uh, during today's discussion. No, that, that will be great. Um, that'll be great. Um, so going back to John, then keeping up with the sort of post COVID changes and you know, Ryan hinted at both the, the, the cross state licensing as well as the reimbursement. And we'll talk about some of the other regulatory changes. Um, from your perspective, John, from Zipnosis and just thinking about the, the virtual care as a general sector, um, which segments did you see were most affected by some of these changes? Which segments have seen more growth during COVID or you know, how it's sort of changing due to COVID when we still think about that market, the regulatory and reimbursement changes? Yeah, so I think that the easiest, <clears throat> the one that had by volume, the biggest impact was um, you know, urgent care, primary care, and that was almost entirely related to COVID illnesses or the shift of normal sort of urgent care visits from the clinic setting to a virtual setting. Um, and that was, you know, um, nonlinear. I mean, we saw almost 4,000% uh, increase in volume over about a seven week or seven day time span. And that was pretty typical if you look across the industry, you know, just historic increases. So the biggest impact on a volume was in that sort of urgent care market. So what's interesting is when you move, when, you know, the physical location shut down that, that forces a lot of other services to get uh, virtualized. So what you saw quickly then were as many other sort of clinical specialties start to say, hey, maybe we can do virtual care. Probably the most durable and I think the most impactful is gonna be behavioral health. And that is an area where we have seen not only just rapid adoption in, in you know, cognitive behavioral therapy, talk behavioral therapy, those kind of things are, are really well suited for traditional telemedicine but they also afford really interesting advantages for anonymity, uh, mobilization. There's been um, a pretty good movement generally for reducing regulations and ensuring reimbursement. And certainly because you see a lot of employers focusing on employee health and mental well health and wellness, you've seen those services also have sustained and, and I think durable reimbursement behind them. So I think behavioral health is absolutely gonna be an area where um, you see uh, maybe not that sort of huge spike that we saw re for COVID-related illnesses, but it's going to continue to be transformed and I think be um, uh, probably largely virtual um, for most of the sort of the basic conditions. Um, a couple of other areas that we saw it increase pretty quickly. Um, physical therapy is one that we think is also moving uh, rapidly into much more uh, digital. A lot of great learning tools there. Um, and then sort of um, uh, post-surgical as well. Um, and that's a little bit harder because if elective surgeries are, you know, getting pushed out again, you're not going to see that um, take a hold. Uh, but certainly as we've looked across um, our customer partners and just for, for relative volume to put numbers to it, 
for that COVID spike, like we said, we saw about a 4,000% increase. We still saw a three to five, per, five times increase in non-COVID virtualization across the board. Um, and that just, that speaks to, you know, how deep and broad this change was. Yeah, no, I was, um, I think that's one of the first questions people have, like, we were seeing these changes, like what, how long are these transitory or are they really some of the permanent changes? Um, and, and Ryan, I wanted to get a sense from you in terms of, you know, John kind of laid out the segments and which are, which seem to be probably more COVID independent, you know, growth trajectories as we sort of uh, see going forward. But from the regulatory perspective, are you able to comment on sort of how permanent are some of these regulatory environment changes? And then what I would like both of you to comment is we do have an audience question and that kind of to me, the way I interpret comes to the, uh, it hits to that idea around transitory versus permanent change aspects of what's going on. Um, Amy Du uh, asks, Teladoc stock dropped yesterday when Pfizer's vaccine news came up. I saw that too. Um, I believe telehealth will continue in volume post-vaccine, but I would love to know the panel's reflection on what that means for telehealth demand once there's a vaccine and when we go back to normal. So I'm going to put that on the side, but if Ryan, if you could uh, elaborate more on, the, the, on your perspectives on the regulatory changes and how stable and how, how long are they here to stay, and then you can both reflect on Amy's question. Sure. So, you know, this is just my prediction, of course, right? Lots of this is just um, uh, trying to predict what's going to happen. Uh, you know, one thing that's happening with, you know, COVID is this great experiment going on, right? So some policymakers were slow to embrace telehealth or make substantial changes to the regulatory scheme, be it with licensure, reimbursement, what have you. You know, right now there's this great experiment going on and people are using telehealth, as, as John described, there's been an explosion in telehealth visits. Providers are becoming more comfortable with telehealth. Patients are becoming more comfortable with telehealth, and I think they love the convenience. They see what it can do. I think that's going to open a lot of minds uh, for policymakers, and hopefully some of the changes we've seen will continue. Um, you know, that said, um, maybe we can just go through a couple licensure. I think we'll see, you know, some of the – so all of the rules I described in, you know, in brief earlier, they're still in the books. You know, oftentimes the waivers and by their terms, when the public health emergency expires, we go back to the old way of doing things, right? So all the old licensure rules are still in place. The old reimbursement rules are still in place, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I think that there is push for at the state level or the federal level to make some of these changes permanent. I think we'll see continuing easing of licensure to make it easier for you know providers to practice across state lines. Um, I think we'll see probably, uh, we'll go back a bit to the pre-COVID HIPAA world. So one thing that happened during COVID is, um, you know, the federal government said is okay, uh, for telemedicine providers to talk to patients who are using their smartphones, right? Phones capable of two-way communications. Now, some of those phones wouldn't necessarily have met in the apps. Some of the HIPAA security and privacy requirements that were on the books, you know, pre-COVID, the government said, let's, let's really embrace telehealth. Let's make sure patients can, you know, see telemedicine providers in a safe manner uh, during the COVID crisis. Um, so I think we will see, we'll probably go back some of the pre-COVID HIPAA requirements um, but uh, I think they'll be modified in some way to make it easier again for patients to connect directly with providers using their smartphones. Uh, you know, during this time period, we have seen a rise of, you know, cyber attacks, um, both on healthcare providers and also, uh, you know, the general public. So I think there will be increased focus on cybersecurity rules um, to make sure that telemedicine encounters are done in a, you know, secure fashion. Uh, reimbursement, I think we'll, and John, you may I'm sure you've thought a lot about this too. Love to hear your thoughts, but I think there is a greater push to make sure we have, you know, continued focus on parity laws to make sure that telemedicine encounters are, you know, reimbursed at the same rate as in-person encounters. Um, I think we'll see a loosening of the Medicare rules. And, you know, so there have been some recent changes that are sort of outside of COVID where Medicare is signaling they're going to continue to support telemedicine in a, in a new way without as many restrictions in the past. No, thank you, Ryan. Um, John, did you want to reflect on the reimbursement question Ryan tossed to you? Yeah, for sure. And and then I'd love to segue into the you know the teledoc and permanence. But I I, I think um, I agree entirely um, with Ryan. I think that the biggest question is going to be 
um, how long is it, is parity going to stay the same? Is there going to be a slight regression? I think our interpretation is that <clears throat> for the long haul, they're not going to reimburse virtual care and in-person visits at the same level. I think that will change at some point. It won't be across the board, uh, but there will probably be some correction. The flip side is, again, in, in those that are in value-based um, arrangements and others, this can be really advantageous. And that's part of the, the narrative that you also have to keep in mind is in a fee-for-service world, maybe that, that might seem as, a, as, as some sort of regression, but certainly when we look at partners that look, that look at virtual care as a really great tool to reduce their expense, their medical expense, um, I think you're gonna continue to see widespread adoption. And even though that, that fee-for-service might not be a parity, I think you're gonna see a lot more um, uh, business models, especially in at-risk. Um, continue to have virtual care because here's the thing: there were two, there were a lot of things that were holding virtual care back. Some of it artificial, as Ryan mentioned, with with outdated regulations, and and some of it was cultural. And whether <laughs> to be crass, but you know, virtual care COVID was the best marketing for telemedicine ever. I mean, it forced it into consumers' hands, and we all realized, like, all right, it's not that bad, you know. And it was kind of true also for providers who really the laggards in all of this adoption, they, they were forced to use it and they go, all right, I can do this. So I think the wall has been crushed. Is it gonna be 100% equal to parity reimbursement today? No, but I, we're not gonna fall back into you know, pre-COVID days. I, I, but I but you're, you're, you're um, uh, basically conjecturing that it, there will be some correction, but the correction will be different by sort of the segment of care too, it sounds like. Yep. And in um, our assumption, in the data that we see across our, our partners, and this is mo mostly healthcare providers again, um, we don't have a lot of visibility on the payer side of it, but they assume 20 to 30% of their volume is gonna be virtual. I, I, I think that's kind of a number we feel pretty comfortable in, in saying, not 50%, not 10%. Uh, it's probably in that range. Do either one of you wanna segue into Amy's question on Teladoc? <laughs> Yeah, so I think a couple of things to just keep in mind. So first of all, it's a public market. The public markets, when you look at the number of telemedicine providers out there, they're just frothy, right? They're hungry for anything out there. So you gotta, you gotta be real careful about um, judging the permanence based on a, a single stock day. Um, so that's, I think that's my first comment. The second would be, um, even with vaccinations out there, this isn't just going away tomorrow. And when you look at the size of the organization, when you look at how health plans are put together, when you look at how budgets are built within huge multi-billion dollar health systems, these are battleships, folks. They do not turn on a dime and they are making year, two year bets. And in the, almost all the Medicare, Medicaid plans have virtual care in them for the next year. I mean, this again is not gonna sort of, again, fall back flat. Again, it might be a little bumpy. We're still a little bit early and you're gonna see that reflected in maybe what Teladoc and other Amwell would be another company to kind of look at, uh, but by no means is it, first of all, is it just gonna go away? There's still gonna to continue to be a large percentage of the population at risk. And two, um, I think the, um, uh, the prevailing tailwinds behind it are, are so significant on multiple fronts. No, thank you. Um, Ryan, I want to go back to sort of the regulatory environment questions a little bit because you, you mentioned two, uh, two of them, the cross-state licensing and the reimbursement, right? Um, could you say a little bit more about what other regulatory changes, like could you define and share with the audience on like scope of practice and prescriptive authority and, and what they are and um, how did they change with COVID-19? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, let's start maybe with prescriptive authority. So, um, you know, to, to make a telemedicine encounter, so, um, you know, truly meaningful for a patient, if, you know, there's a problem, they want to get a prescription, right, on, online. They don't want to go then in person and see a physician or other practitioner to get that prescription, right? So a key question in any, you know, telemedicine arrangement is, you know, what is the prescriptive authority of the practitioners who are providing telemedicine to the patients? And that varies by state. And you know, one of the key questions is, um, how do you establish the physician-patient relationship such that you can make a prescription, right? And some states have a requirement for an in-person examination, and that can be challenging. Can that be done online? Um, you know, sometimes uh, the language and the regulation allows for the in-person exam to be conducted in a virtual environment. Other times, it requires face-to-face, -face and you have to have a physical in-person encounter. 
again, that those rules maybe made sense uh, 20 years ago, but giving the technology we have today with real time, uh, you know, audio and video interaction, uh, sometimes, you know, supported with other um, uh, technology, um, some of those rules just don't make a lot of sense anymore. And, and during COVID, some of those in-person requirements or face-to-face -face requirements prior to making a prescription uh, were waived or temporarily suspended. And I think that was very helpful and meaningful for both patients and providers, right? It helped deal with patient volume in the physical space. It helped keep providers and the patients safe. And we didn't see some of the uh, big concerns that policymakers used to fret about really materialize, at least from the data I've seen. And there, there could be things I haven't seen, of course, in that regard. Um, but I think that, again, you'll see a loosening of what it, it takes to create that uh, physician-patient relationship after we, or practitioner-patient relationship after we leave the COVID era, which will make um, a number of things easier, including prescriptive authority. Mm -hmm. No, thank you. Um, John, do you want to comment a little bit about how these regulatory environment changes are impacting your business at Hypnosis and your interactions with other, you know, your partners and other organizations you work with? Yeah, I mean, I, I think you've, you've heard Ryan allude to the complexity um, that exists within regulations. And just to kind of give you the different dimensions, right, you have state-by-state -state licensure, you have state-by-state -state pharmacy boards, so you have medical boards, you have pharmacy boards, you have nursing boards. Not all of them have the same, you know, rules and regulations as it pertains to how you practice medicine and certainly not telemedicine. So you have 50, you know, you have 150 different themes and variations on that. Then you have different regulations for controlled medications, and you have different regulations for minors, and you have different regulations for behavioral health and, and other sorts of care delivery. And suddenly, I, so I, just to put it in perspective, I was at um, a telemedicine conference in Washington, D.C. last year when you could actually travel, right? And we had, um, there were two, three lawyers sitting up there. And this is like, I mean, these are some of the top minds in, in telemedicine law. They had state um, representatives, federal representatives, and then sort of industry. And they were kind of going through the patchwork of those regulations, uh, especially as it pertained to behavioral health, which is in the mental health crisis, a huge problem. And finally, at the end of it, I said, can anybody tell me a pathway to do national behavioral health in this country? There wasn't a single person in that room who could tell you that. So that's where we started. So I, the, that's a long way to say, this is nothing but good. This is nothing but progress. Some of these may be waivers, but at the end of the day, we are moving from this Gordian knot of regulation and complexity into something that is infinitely better. It's not there yet, but it's moving in the right direction. And that is absolutely essential because there are services like mental health and behavioral health that are essential, that can be delivered effectively, that have great data behind them. And we are literally killing ourselves because we can't get the regulations out of the way. So I think the, 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 the long answer to that is we are moving in the right direction. We need to continue to advocate for simplicity. We have to be able to have consistent regulation. Our interactions have gotten significantly easier um, across the board. Um, and I think that's gonna continue to persist. And, and certainly we continue to be strong advocates for simplicity and, and clarity across the board. Um, Ryan, do you agree with um, some of the, these areas like John is mentioning the behavioral health? Like if you were to think about the priority, high priority areas um, that uh, the regulations have to be really sorted out and, and stay, you know, sorted out for, for, for good, what would be some of your key priority areas where there's such a need? Yeah, I mean, great question. So I mean, I think to John's point, um, the, the simpler things can be the better for everyone. It just allows businesses to work across multiple states, hopefully at a national level. Um, you know, many states have worked together to try to make licensure more streamlined through compacts. You know, their scope of practice, you know, compacts for different um, practitioners. Um, and so, you know, hopefully there's more, you know, state cooperation. But I think we need leadership at the federal level, too, to make some of this happen. Just to make sure that, again, you're not dealing with this patchwork of various state laws. And as John mentioned, it's great. It's not just you know, 50 different sets of rules and regulations. You have to look at each practitioner too and each licensing board. And there's a lot of complexity. And for say for a startup company in this space, I mean, the, the cost of trying to figure out um, how to deal with this at a national level, it's very expensive, right? I mean- Yeah, and, Ryan's uh, in business. <laughs> that's right. So, I mean, right. <laughs> so, 
So it's, it's good for us, right? It's good for lawyers, but not good for the telemedicine providers. Right? <laughs> Especially so. startups, right? Um, That's right. That's right. Um, you know, we just have an audience comment. Uh, congratulations for your company and efforts. Uh, that's Ravinder Singh. Especially in affordable healthcare areas like mental health illness uh, can make a huge um, difference. So behavioral health, mental health, these seem to be some of the areas that everyone is converging on. Um, by the way, audience, please send us questions. I'm happy to share them with our panelists. And you know, I'm uh, monitoring both the chat, chat and the Q&A. Um, so let me uh, shift gears a little bit. Uh, we talked about sort of the, the conjectures and the regulations and some of the challenges. Um, um, so what kind of, and maybe John, we can start with you. Um, I mean, this is all great. There, I mean, we discussed some of these benefits, right? Um, but do you, can you foresee some of the social impacts of the evolution of telemedicine? Are there any early insights, you know, on the benefits we've touched on, but I would love before you to elaborate on, but also some gaps and maybe some unintended comp, uh, consequences from sort of the more social impact point of view? Yeah, so I mean, we obviously I'm passionate about virtual care, but it's it's not perfect, right? And I think the the sign that it's real the sign that we are moving into a world where virtual it's definitely going to be integrated into it, it are the is how the conversation is changing from can i do a virtual visit to how does this work at scale across populations so here's a little bit of what we've seen in the past six months as virtual care has proliferated some really interesting data points so pre-covid about 73% of our users were women between the ages of 25 and 45. A year after year after year after year, very, very closely matched um, uh, retail clinics, that user base, again, heavily female and for a, a pretty small subset. What's interesting is, and men were just basically off the, off the map. I mean, men were not using the service um, uh, on a regular basis. When you look at some of the data though, is through COVID is that men um, by almost a two to one factor have been using virtual care for COVID related um, um, illness, which is a, a, a market increase, right? It's really fascinating. We don't know why, but this would be the first time outside of things that are specifically male related, like, you know, erectile dysfunction or, you know, baldness or other things like that where you actually see men adopting. Um, I know I haven't seen enough data in behavioral health. I'd be interested to kind of see if there's also a similar trend or breakdown that's a little bit more equal between genders. But certainly that was something that we, we caught in the data that was very surprising. Um, the, was the, the amount of men, relationship of men using the service for COVID uh, related symptoms versus women. Um, so I think that's positive. I think it means that we're, in, we're engaging with new populations and certainly um, uh, having men more engaged within the healthcare community is nothing but good. So other data that's maybe a little bit more worrisome, um, a lot of our partners, so we just license our technology to healthcare providers. They use their clinicians, they use their brand. So we're just kind of the, um, the virtual care engine behind it, which means we get to see across all of our customers, but we don't really have a, a horse in the race on how they deliver the care. But one of our customers came back to us and said, what we've seen is a, a market difference between urban and rural usage patterns. And it was directly related to bandwidth and also um, income levels. And that, that's, a, that's a little bit worrying where urban with higher income, generally trending, less diverse, were more apt in using virtual care than more socioeconomically um, repressed, depressed environments in more diverse environments and, and communities. So I think it's also marking sort of what we know is out there, but highlighting some of the disparities that exist. Certainly it's been able to break down other ones, mobility and, and other areas. But early on, I think those are two opportunities um, and, and some of the data that we're seeing on the social impacts. Um, please, both of you feel free to, to, uh, to respond to this comment. I mean, those are really important two observations that you see in your data and I'm, you know, I'm not that surprised. I actually didn't know about the gender disparity <laughs> aspect of it. So that's very surprising with the sort of these uh, geographic rural urban disparities. So, I mean, these are important sort of 
um, observations to start thinking about informing policy and reimbursement and how some of the new business models will evolve uh, in the industry. Or do you have, do either one of you have thoughts on what does it mean? Like what can the policy do or what, how can reimbursement change or what other um, technologies are needed perhaps to, to address some of the, especially the second disparity that you highlighted, John? Yeah, I mean, I think some of it, <clears throat> so I think there's a couple of things from a tech perspective. So in the, in the virtual care world, a lot of reimbursement comes down to uh, what we call the mode of care. And that generally gets segmented into synchronous care and asynchronous care. Synchronous care is what we're doing right here. It's video, it's phone, we're talking, we're interacting in real time. And that's kind of been traditional reimbursement has generally been better for it on a fee-for-service basis. Asynchronous is where um, you're interacting with a machine, maybe you send something over, you get a response back. It's much more akin to how you shop on Amazon or something else. You're not actually talking to a real person. So one of the areas, but the, re, the, the virtual sort of real-time synchronous requires high bandwidth. It requires a video camera on your device. It requires good bandwidth connection. And that immediately sets a bar that a lot of people, especially if you are you know, earning less than $40,000 a year, might not have the financial resources to have reliable internet connection or the devices to be able to do that. So I think one of the easy ways from a policy perspective is to ensure that both synchronous and asynchronous modes of communication, high bandwidth and low bandwidth are reimbursed at the same rate because that will immediately start to create an equal playing field where maybe you don't have the same experience, but you're able to reach a bigger population in a more reliable fashion. So that's one example of how I would solve that. Um, Ryan, do you have any um, insights from your clients and their needs regarding some of these issues John raised? You know, I, I think John hit upon the, the sort of the big, you know, solution. Um, beyond that, I don't have any other any other comments. No, that that's very very interesting. Um, so next, I want to sort of talk about maybe Ryan, we could start with you as you work with the clients um, for this virtual healthcare space to take off and stay with us. What sort of strategic partnerships have to exist? Like, what kind of partnerships have you put together? that have worked well but that, or that they haven't worked well? Yeah, sure. So, you know, I think that um, the partnerships that have worked well, of course, are where um, both parties are bringing something valuable to the table, that goes without saying. Um, you know, but I've seen uh, providers work with, you know, great, you know, technology companies, um, you know, telemedicine platform companies. And when those arrangements are put together the right way, um, that can be, uh, you know, transformative for, for the provider and the provider's patient population. Um, you know, the key to putting any good partnership together, of course, is making sure that um, people are thinking about the future, not just, the, you know, the, the arrangement from day one, but where it might go, how it might grow, because, you know, telemedicine is growing, the technology is changing. And where I've seen issues sometimes is where people aren't thinking, you know, about the, what the future might look like and trying to address some of those things, you know, in the contract, if they can. It doesn't always make sense to go beyond the initial term of an agreement, but to the extent you can think what things might look like in the future, um, and then kind of move towards that, those, those shared goals, that can be helpful. I think that maybe going a bit beyond your question, um, you know, one challenge I think for putting together partnerships is, you know, again, some of the rules and regulations that get in the way. And some of those rules and regs, you know, make, make sense, right? But others that sometimes limit the flow of data between the partners and the arrangement, uh, I think make it hard for the participants in the arrangement to really realize the full value um, in terms of what they can, how they can transform and improve healthcare. Right. So remember, telemedicine is part of a, the digital healthcare and you know healthcare ecosystem. Um, you know there are providers, there are other digital health companies, uh, there are other uh, non-healthcare companies who are just part of this ecosystem. And the more they can share data to find ways to better improve healthcare, lower costs, you know, cooperate. That could be transformative for for healthcare, uh, for the healthcare industry, better for patients, better for consumers, and lots of the rules we have, mostly concerning privacy and security of data. And those are those are real things. We should have regulations protecting privacy and security, but not in a way that stifles innovation. Not in a way that really doesn't allow players in this you know in this sandbox to transform healthcare using all the data that's available. Um, you know the un friction sometimes that prevents that kind of sharing communicating. I don't think it serves really anyone's interest. That's my personal perspective, right? But 
Um, not all policymakers are on the same page. Yeah. <laughs> um, John, how about from sort of the business perspective for you, what are some of the key strategic partnerships that exist or that help and that, that, that there, that there, we have a lack of, uh, one other sort of a follow-up that I want to blend in, uh, an audience, uh, question, which is related to partnerships or anti-partnerships. I don't know how you want to take it, but it's about how much pushback and lobbying is, do you have against you from established practices such as the hospital practices also? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the status quo is massive. So just, I, I think to put things in perspective, you know, telemedicine has been around for decades um, and certainly viable, credible technology solutions have been around for decades as well. It literally took a global pandemic to get healthcare to change and embrace this. So I think you can't underestimate, you know, the status quo um, in, in sort of finding ways to resist technology. That said, I think everything that we've talked about today, um, if, you, if you talk to anybody in the healthcare ecosystem on the patient, provider, or payer, if you look at that kind of as the, the triangle in healthcare, I think everybody now assumes that digital has got to be a part of their experience and a part of their business plan. And that's still nascent, but it's different. And so I think the pushback of, do I need it is relatively gone. And now it's more, how do I use it to support my business model? Or how do I create business models that are going to be even more disruptive potentially on top of it? And to me, that's where it gets exciting. It's not even as much about the tech. It's about the new business models that are going to be enabled by getting over that threshold. Well, that makes perfect sense. Um, so we talked about data, Ryan, you mentioned sort of some of the key partnerships are actually structured around data. Um, successful partnerships. And so in terms of data and data standards, like how have they stood in the way of telemedicine? Um, and for both of you, um, you know, where do you see some of these data standards going to make telemedicine sort of fully integrated into the healthcare system? What changes are needed to make this happen? And I want to put in an audience question here as well. Um, as it relates, Sarah Stefan asks, how do you balance the goal of increasing interoperability with the reality of creating proprietary platforms? Huh. What either yes, one? Yes, I mean, that, 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 that last question is great. I mean, lots of business models were based upon the proprietary sort of data silos, right? Where they didn't want to share and allow others to necessarily uh, fill their shoes if an arrangement was terminated. Um, you know, there are some new inter interoperability information blocking rules that will allow you know, patients to really unlock their data and share with a variety of you know, third parties, right? So they can better use their data to improve their healthcare. Um, so that, that is promising. And those rules are going to go into effect very soon. Um, I'd love to hear you know, John's perspective on where these rules have sort of created headaches for many in the industry. But you know, the you know, HIPAA rules, uh, state privacy rules, again, at the state level, you have this patchwork of laws, right? So every state can have their own privacy rules that put more restrictions in place than HIPAA. Everyone hears, you know, hears and talks about the HIPAA privacy rule and security rule, and that's, there's a reason for that. But to the, to the extent a state has more protective, more stringent you know, privacy rules, those trump. And so again, going back to the theme, um, you know, this patchwork creates a lot of complexity and cost for national you know, healthcare uh, telemedicine uh, companies. Right, trying to figure out how can they acquire data, how can they use the data, who can they share it with, under what circumstances. And you know, HIPAA is the starting point. You also have to look at state rules and regs. Um, and there's a lot of complexity there and in traps for the unwary, even if you know, well-intentioned. So I think to the extent we can sort of clarify some of those rules and make it easier for groups to share data to really improve the patient experience, improve their telemedicine offerings, I think that'd be you know, good for the industry. Thanks. John? Yeah, I think on the, on the proprietary, you know, how do you manage it? It, it really is kind of about, I think at a hot, the analogy is what's the pivot point for your experience and the data that you're relying on? And I think being intentional about understanding because a lot of the conversations come down to, do you want best in breed, but most likely proprietary, or do you want something that's standardized, um, but perhaps a little bit generic? And that, that interface between the data that you have, what you're relying on, whether or not it's an HL7 standard, smart on fire, 
or more payer-based data to build your proprietary experience, that's what you have to think about. And it's not a, it's probably not like the, the formula that you want, but that's the way I think about it. How reliant are we? What's our pivot point? Can we find interface standards? Are there easy ways to translate the data? How do I minimize my reliance on that data? Do I understand the integrity of it? Those are all the questions that kind of come into play as you think about whether or not you bias more towards a proprietary experience. Again, might be transformative and wonderful. And you see that in a lot of, um, so for example, if you've seen Roman or Hims or hers, a lot of these direct to consumer companies, they went all the way to that end of the spectrum and said, you know what? We're gonna build a great consumer experience, beautiful brand, beautiful people, beautiful products. And we kind of don't care at all about interfacing with Epic and a lot of the HL7 and all this other stuff. I mean, they've got HIPAA's you know, basic requirements, but they basically discarded it and went all in on the consumer. There are others who are only like an Epic just around that, that uh, sort of proprietary data models and, or, um, sorry, standardized data models. And those are the, I think the, the interface points that you, you just have to pay attention to. Um, John, do you think we need new data standards? Uh, going forward, or are we good? Uh, I generally think our our coding standards are are cumbersome. I think the real question I, that that I would love to pose to Ryan is, can we just stop talking about medical data standards and just harvest what Google, Apple, and Facebook know about us? I mean, can't we just say they've already got a more robust medical history about us and, and say, why don't we just use those systems? I mean, how, how, how do you reconcile that question with the reality that there are platforms that know more about me clinically than Epic does at Fairview, you know? <laughs> All right. No, I mean, I think that's a great point. I mean, I mean, some of the data they have is, is more predictive to your point than what you have in the medical record, right? And in, in surprising ways, um, you know, the search terms you use, the, the keystrokes you use, the language you use in your emails and your posts. I mean, it's very predictive of something that might be going on with your mental health or physical health. And to the extent we could actually <laughs> use that data um, or incorporate into the medical record or allow you know, groups to share that data back and forth, that could be, you know, very predictive and helpful for patients and those trying to diagnose and treat patients. But then you're at the mercy of, you know, those systems too. That's and right. I, so that's part of it. But I would argue that even our current data standards are not, they certainly are not patient friendly. They're, they're right. still walled behind it, so. All right. Well, we have just a few more minutes. Um, if there's any audience question, please let me know through the chat box or the Q&A. Um, but in, just sort of to wrap up our conversation, I guess I will pose the question of, is the word telemedicine gone? Like is telemedicine dead? Should we call it now just medicine with virtual care integrated? Yeah, I mean, I've been championing for years that telemedicine is dead. And I think <laughs> finally we're at a point where we can start to call it medicine. And I'll keep beating that drum. The market's gonna continue to use telemedicine, so it's not really dead. Uh, but I, I do think that we are at a really important inflection point where, again, if you just assume virtual or digital tools are part of that experience. Um, we'll look for 10 years and see that it is just medicine. What do you think, Ryan? Yeah, I, I, I mean, totally agree. I, I like the way uh, John described it. Um, you know, from the consumer's perspective, from the providers, from the payers, hopefully everyone just views it as, as medicine, right? Um, you know, in the regulatory world, there might be specific rules and regs that apply to telemedicine encounters, just like they apply to other ways you provide you know, medical care, whether it's a medical device or, or you know, or something else. But um, so there might be defined terms buried in the, in the in the legal text, but hopefully from the public's perspective, from the policymakers' perspective, it's all just medicine. No, that, that's great. Well, thank you so much. Um, if there is no other question from the audience, I just want to also just leave the floor to you to if there, there are any questions I didn't sort of ask or highlight that you would like to share with, with all of us, please. No, I, I think my, my parting comment would be, you know, it's a, it's a totally new era. I wouldn't um, in any way, shape or form assume that, that clinical care is not gonna have a huge part of, of digital uh, baked into it, but we're also still early. And um, for those that are looking to get into the industry, 
it's a great time. It's a formative time. Um, and there are a lot of really important questions that we need to be able to answer, not just around data and, and regulations and policy, but about the social impacts. And as it gets woven into that medicine, um, we're going to have to address those. And it's going to be on the shoulders of the next generation of, of entrepreneurs and policymakers to, to, to do that. And so I'd encourage you to read up, get, in, get engaged, and, and certainly be a part of this next gen. Thank you. Ryan, your departing thoughts with our panel? You know, yeah, no, I, I agree with what John said. And you know, I would say stay tuned. Um, you know, some of the problems that I teed up and John talked about, about the patchwork of regulations, the complexity, the burden, there, there is focus now in trying to make things easier for everyone and try to, you know, you know, you know, focus on the rules and regs that get in the way of, uh, of telemedicine and remove some of those barriers. And so I, I think we're going to see meaningful change to, to make telemedicine really continue to grow, uh, to allow digital health to continue to, you know, to, to uh, be part of the healthcare ecosystem. So stay tuned, pay attention. I think we'll see a lot of change in the coming years. And it going in a positive direction. Yeah. Thank you so much. And and certainly we at the Carlson School are keeping up with it. And you know, I teach uh, healthcare marketplace both MBAs and undergrads. We definitely blended in this time. Uh, devoted uh, lecture time for telemedicine and how it has evolved. And um, but we won't call it telemedicine anymore, right? We will just call it medicine in <laughs> next year's uh, syllabus. Well, thank you so much for joining us and have a wonderful evening. And uh, um, audience, please let us know if you have any further questions. We're happy to share them with both John and Ryan and get you connected with them. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.